My friends, I'm sure you've heard the reports that inflation has soared to its highest rate in four decades, with consumer prices jumping by 7% for the year ending in December. Uh, we, I just heard from a listener, Len, who went to the grocery store and saw the same thing that I saw on Saturday, empty shelves. Uh, couldn't find this, couldn't find that. Well, guess what? The Soviet-style shopping is here, my friends. It is here. And we're very, uh, very, uh, well, well, let's put it this way. We're very pleased to have with us Mark Mix, the president of the National Right to Work Committee, president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. Mark's been uh, our guest a number of times. As a matter of fact, I think he was on Dan Bongino's show. I think I heard him recently. Mark, welcome back to the program. How are you, sir? Jake, I'm doing fine. Good to hear your voice again. I know you're out on location. You're doing business every day, and I appreciate that. So, but it's good to talk with you again. <laughs> it, it, before we get to talking about the uh, Bidenomics disaster, uh, I wanted to just get your um, opinion of what happened just recently at the Mount Air plant in Selbyville. Now, uh, you were on this broadcast a number of times last year, and we know that once the Biden regime took over the NLRB, uh, well, they they... They, uh, they loaded the NLRB with a bunch of uh, union bosses, and they tried to scuttle uh, the decision by workers at the Mount Air plant in Selbyville to decertify the union. It was the only Mount Air plant in the country that actually had union representation. But there was a, a revote, and the revote uh, was 356 to 80 to tell the union to take a hike. Um, what, what is your thoughts uh, just a couple of weeks after that decision? Yeah, Jake, you know, and thank you for, for bringing attention to this whole thing over the last two years, frankly. You know, we were representing an employee there that was trying to get a decertification election. They filled out the requisite number of signatures. They went to the National Labor Relations Board in Baltimore. The Baltimore regional director granted them the ability to have the vote based on some illegal language in the contract that uh, basically said they had to pay union dues from the start of their employment, which is illegal. And immediately, the union filed an appeal, and they wanted to block the election. They wanted to block the ability for these workers to have a vote on whether or not the union could continue to represent them. And so what happened with the union appeal is they used what, uh, as a defense, something called the contract bar, which basically means when there's a contract in place that workers can't decertify a union for up to three years. And the National Labor Relations Board, in the meantime, actually conducted a, an election. They had mm -hmm. the ballots. Ballots were cast. And ballots were impounded. They were never opened, pending the outcome of a National Labor Relations Board decision, whether or not those votes should be counted and whether or not the regional director correctly ruled that there should have been a vote to begin with. And what happened is the NLRB said, no, it, the contract bar would apply. And so the employees there at Mount Air, they basically took the votes they already cast and they threw them in the garbage. They never counted them, never opened them. But then the window opened again for them to try for decertification again, and they did. Listen, we didn't represent them this time. Uh, the foundation didn't have clients in this one because it was going to be pretty pro forma, and they got their election. And sure enough, Jake, when the votes were counted, the workers th there at the Mount Air plate, uh, plant in Selbyville said they would be better off without the union represent them. So, and it was an overwhelming vote, no surprise to us. We thought that would yeah. be the outcome if they actually opened the ballots the first time. But instead of opening them, they threw them out and made the workers just go over, you know, jump several more hurdles to exercise their rights in the workplace, which they did. So it's a good outcome. You know, those, what Mount Air has to do now is take care of those employees and build a relationship with them that is based on, you know, trust. And, and if they do that, there'll be no need for a union to ever come back in. Mark, it was my understanding that Mount Air immediately announced uh, a benefit package for these employees after the vote, uh, after the decertification. And Mount Air obviously has a very good reputation in this community as an employer. I've never heard anything bad about them. As a matter of fact, I've only heard good. Uh, the, the fact that there is no union representation at any other Mount Air plant, I think, says something. But uh, they, they immediately came, uh, came out with uh, the announcement of the benefit package for employees. I wonder, uh, the uh, um, employee that uh, started this whole thing, uh, Mr. Oscar Cruz Sosa, uh, I'm sure you've had a chance to speak to Mr. Sosa since. What, what is the general feeling there at the plant with, among the employees? Yeah, well, I, I have not spoken to him personally. We, our attorney that was representing him previously had, had spoken with him, and, and they're, they're very encouraged. And you're right. I mean, Mount Air has taken care of their employees very well. And if I recall correctly, this plant was actually an acquisition by them, that it came with the union, if I recall historically. That may not be true, but they do take care of their employees. And 
It's interesting, Jake. I'm sitting here in Raleigh, North Carolina at the airport heading back to Washington, D.C. this afternoon. But I just got done talking with another small businessman who bought a company that had a union, and, and they tried to give a pay raise to the workers immediately upon buying the plant, right. and uh, the union rejected the pay raise. They wouldn't allow, them, <laughs> allow, the, <laughs> allow the, the employer to increase their pay. Uh. They increased the pay for all the non-union workers at the plant, but the union said you can't increase the pay for the union workers there. And uh, obviously, that was a couple years ago, and that union, those workers at that particular plant have voted their union out. They did that a couple years ago, and uh, now the company's flourishing, and the employees are happy. And the employer understands that you got to take care of your employees. And I don't know Mount Air has done that, and they will continue to do that, I'm sure. But I think the workers there now can, interestingly enough, Jake, talk specifically and directly with their supervisors without a union official present. Um, those are some of the some of the kind of the rules and regulations that come with a monopoly collective union that is mm -hmm. in place, you know, with only only over six percent of the private sector workforce now in America. Our guest is Mark Mix, president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense. Uh, foundation, I believe it's foundation, right? Uh, yes, it is Defense Foundation. Mark, uh, I need to take a break, but what I, I want to come back. I want to talk about uh, the economy and what uh, the Biden regime's cushy relationship is with union bosses and uh, is doing to our economy. We already know what they've done uh, with the National Labor Relations Board. We just talked about that. But could the cushy relationship of the Biden regime and unions be affecting our economy? We're going to talk about that with Mark Mix in just a moment on Del Marva Live 92-7-98-5. We are the talk of Del Marva. Mark Mix, president of the National Right to Work Committee, president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. And we know that uh, the Bidenomics, the Biden regime, their handling of the economy, well, we're in a, we're in a mess today, my friends. It's a mess. And is, though... Uh, Biden's so bad at handling the economy that he can't even create cushy union jobs for his big fat cat labor friends. Well, uh, if you see what uh, the regime did to the NLRB, I think you can pretty much understand. But let's find out what Mark Mix thinks. Mark, uh, what do you think? And do the unions and the cushy relationship that they have with Plugs Biden, uh, do they have a role in our economic best that we're going through today? Yeah, absolutely. But first, Jake, I'd like you to understand the, the significance of a horse with no name by America. I'm still trying to understand that. But anyway, well, but did you ever go through the desert with a horse with no name? Mark? No? <laughs> anyway, no, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, yeah. if you look at if you look at the Biden policies and you look at this, the, the narrative that he is, uh, you know, spouting off about being, you know, the most pro-union president in the country, you have to wonder why the Keystone Pipeline is shut down. Yeah, that was a project. Those were union jobs, right? Exactly. All of them were. And why they why they were putting a ban on, on new exploration for oil and gas on federal lands around the country where most of those jobs are unionized. I mean, if you're a rank and file worker from from the pipe fitters union or the operating engineers and you were working on the Keystone Pipeline mm -hmm. and, you know, your your union endorses this guy for president. And within a week of his uh, taking office, he stops your job and puts you on the unemployment line. You right. wonder what being the most pro-union president in America means. It means being <laughs> the most pro-union official president. Right union boss of a president in the country's history. So you're right. The policies they've had have hurt rank-and-file workers. There's no question about it. I mean, when you're shutting down businesses, uh, you're hurting union members, When you're and you're hurting regular citizens to ordinary citizens, too. But, yeah, his policies, the, the rhetoric is one thing. What the what happens on the ground, the results on the ground are totally different. The um, impact that the unions, the union bosses had in the 2020 election was being talked about quite a bit. And were the, were the rank and file union members going to break with their union bosses and vote for Donald Trump over uh, Plugs Biden? But I'm just wondering what you think going into the 2020 midterms and what you're hearing, Mark. Uh, do you think that there's more of a split now with the rank and file? They are more determined than ever to break with their union bosses and vote for uh, job creators rather than the uh, friends of union bosses. What do you think? Yeah, I think that wind is blowing right now, Jake. Whether right. it sustains itself through November is another question. You know, the uh, the life cycle of a political trend is about a day and a half sometimes. <laughs> That's so true. Than that. <clears throat> but the bottom line is this. I mean, when you look at the economy and you look at there's, you know, uh, even though they, they tout an unemployment rate of 3.9%, when you think about the, the job participation rate, the workforce participation rate, meaning people are actively out there, is 61% uh, at the end of last year compared to 64% uh, basically at the end of 2020, mm -hmm. you know, how can you create this narrative that somehow the economy is better off? I mean, you just don't count people that aren't trying anymore, I guess. 
and you say that it's the lowest unemployment rate in the last 40 years. And it's just, it, when you look around, you know that's not true. And I think, you know, ordinary folks in, in middle America and small towns in Delaware understand that. When they go to the grocery store and they see that bacon's $6 a pound or, or you know, two steaks are 50 bucks or whatever the prices are. My, you know, and a gallon of milk is, is $4 and, and it's just... It, it just gets crazy, and you think about how that happens, and it's it's government policy in many instances that's causing that. I mean, I think you and I have talked about the supply chain, Jake, and, and the ports yeah. and the power that unions have there, whether ships get unloaded and how many ships get unloaded. And, you know, notwithstanding the, the, the White House's narrative about the, the crisis being over, there are more ships parked outside of Los, Los Angeles and Long Beach Port than there were at any time before the crisis started. And yet we're led yeah. to believe that somehow things have gotten better. Nonsense. Mark, I wrote a monologue for my show on Sunday, which aired on Monday, uh, which reflected on my experience at the grocery store. It's not the first time I've written a monologue on seeing empty shelves. We have Soviet-style shopping right now in the United States of America. It's here. Uh, I just had somebody email me just a couple of moments ago. They can't find English muffins in the store, and they're not going to be in the store perhaps until next week. What are we going to have, Soviet-style bread lines, people standing online uh, for a loaf of bread? It's coming. This is how it starts. Yeah, and, and it really is something that, that hopefully will be addressed. And, and the one thing that we do know, I think, Jake, and one thing that history tells us, we've got to open up the economy again. I mean, the idea of thinking about lockdowns and mandates and, and, and particularly, you know, the mandates on, on, uh, on vaccinations for employers. I mean, that stuff, we're seeing the impact on that, not only in the healthcare field, but in the law enforcement field and the fire protection field. There are people that just say no, and if we're going to use the kind of the tyranny of big government to impose this, it's not going to make things better. That's for sure. And I just uh, I read an article uh, this morning on the air that uh, the regime is planning on uh, generating a list, a database of federal employees that are asking for a religious exemption so they can track what their religious exemption is. And I get what are they going to do? Send FBI agents to see if they go to church every Sunday, and if they don't, they're going to pull their religious exemption from. Uh, uh, from getting the vaccine. I mean, it's just, it is really scary what we see going on right now, Mark. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that, the idea of tracking the religious objection. We had a case that we're still litigating that involves a an individual who found out that her union was supporting clauses that she she, she would not, could not support because of right. her religious beliefs. And, and we had the, the union boss sent back a, a letter to her lawyer, or to our lawyer, and to her, right. saying that their theology was incorrect. He knew more about her theology than he, she did, and therefore they were going <laughs> not to allow her religious objection. In fact, this happened to be a Catholic. He sent the same letter to the Catholic bishop who basically attested that this lady had this, you know, sincere religious objection, but it was no right. good because the Catholic bishop didn't know his theology. I mean, this is the kind of uh, power uh, that these people, yeah. these people operate under, and we are in trouble, Jake. We are. Uh, Mark, before I let you go, the Supreme Court uh, hearing uh, with respect to the um, the vaccine mandates and the OSHA, uh, the, the OSHA-inspired uh, enforcement of uh, vaccine mandates, we all heard the ridiculous natures, nature of Sotomayor's uh, statistics that are 100,000 children in, in uh, hospital wards and so forth. How do you think that Supreme Court case is going to come down, Mark? Oh, boy. Jake, if, we, if you and I knew that, we could, be, you know, we could make a whole lot more money. Our pay grade would go up definitively. But I think, I think it's a bridge too far. But then again, we have been surprised again and again. Yeah, it's true. As we kind of wind down. So, I mean, perhaps it's a 5-4 vote or a 6-3 vote or maybe not even a vote that we can, you know, we can agree with once they come down with it. I mean, this, the arguments are the information we got from the hearings were bogus from uh, Kagan and yep. from Sotomayor, not just yep. her, but the That's other right. one. But We'll see, and we'll just have to wait and see. I know that businesses and employers are ready to take action, basically probably reducing their workforce if they're anywhere near 100. Um, I think that's probably one of the results is we'll adjust to it, but uh, it won't be helpful, I think, if they rule the wrong way on this. I think we're all going to be on ventilators if, uh, because we're going to be in such shock if the, uh, if the Supreme Court, uh, the, the country is, our, for all intents and purposes, I think, if the Supreme Court rules with the regime, uh, the, the Constitutional Republic is over. I mean, there, if you can't, if you don't have sovereignty over your own body, Mark, I mean, what what's left? Uh, Jake, you're right. Again, it's always a privilege to talk to you because you 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 bring these things to a very simple point, and that is the, the probably the simplest point that we have in this grand experiment of self government. It really well, is. Mark, I, I thank you. A Demcom uh, sent me an email the other day saying I was uneducated, so you probably hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> 
Mark Mix, president of the National Right to Work Committee, president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. Again, Mark, congratulations to you and everyone at your organization for the work that you did uh, for the employees uh, in Selbaville at the Mount Air Plant. Thanks for coming on and talking to us today about uh, the economic disaster that is the Biden regime. And I'm sure we'll have you on the program again very, very soon. Continued success. Uh, and all the work that you do is, is ne so badly needed in this country, Mark. Please uh, stay with it, okay? Thanks, Jake. Appreciate it.